All right, I'd like to introduce uh, exercise 11-1, which is a, uh, what this is, this is a visual force component, a custom visual force component uh, that, that uh, will reside within a uh, visual force page. And what this uh, does is it allows a user to submit a search. So think of it as being, uh, you know, existing on something like a, uh, a, a page with a list view and it allows us to search for specific candidates. Now uh, in this uh, custom component, the way that this works is it actually utilizes a, uh, uh, a custom controller uh, and what this custom controller will do is it will execute a SOSL query based on what the user uh, identified as the query parameters. Now the way that this works is this uses dynamic SOSL, which is to say that depending upon what the user entered in as the uh, search parameters, we are going to dynamically generate that SOSL query and utilize what they pass to us as a part of what we'll be looking up. Okay, uh, So the user will be able to, uh, for instance, uh, identify which fields in the current object they would like to search on. Okay, uh, so for instance, uh, last name equals Jones or first name equals Ted or whatever it may be. Okay, uh, so we're going to uh, code or complete some logic within this custom controller, uh, write some Apex code to uh, dynamically create that SOSL query, take what the user passes us, and then execute it against the, uh, our search engines. There's also uh, a search config. Um, this has to do with uh, uh, which fields will be returned. In other words, what data do we want to then grab when we find one of these records? So the user is identifying what we're searching for. We're identifying as part of a custom object called search config what we're going to return. In other words, you know, roughly equivalent to what we're selecting, but it's SOSL, not SOCL, so it's a, a little bit different. Uh, in the next exercise, uh, which is 11-2, one of the things that we're going to implement is a dynamic approval process. In an approval process, one of the things that you can do is uh, for each of the steps, you can reference either explicitly reference a particular user or you can reference a related user. The related user is on the record that's being submitted for approval. You can have uh, fields which do a lookup to our users and then you can populate that with the approver. So what that means is that when we run our approval process, the data on the current record being submitted determines who the approvers are. Now, a, a way to implement that, the most basic way to implement that would be the, uh, to allow the person who's editing the record or creating the record or, or what have you, have them populate those fields by clicking on the lookup icon to select the uh, associated users who would then uh, perform the approval steps. What we're going to do is we're going to code a trigger and a class that is actually going to do a lookup in a different custom object and automate the population of those approver fields. So if we think about our uh, universal containers, universal containers has many departments and our logic is that uh, different departments have different sets of approvers. So for instance, uh, one of the approvers for an engineering uh, position would be the VP of engineering. Uh, that would be different from if this was a sales position, the VP of sales would be one of the approvers. Okay? So our logic within our trigger is uh, what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to do a lookup on a custom object we're going to call it uh, a position approval matrix. And what this is going to contain is this is going to contain primarily four fields. The name of the department and then uh, a lookup to each of the three approvers associated with that de uh, department. What we'll do is when we execute our trigger, we will then do a lookup for that uh, record for that specific department that matches the one that uh, our position is for. We would then uh, select the user IDs from the position approval matrix and use those to alter the position that's being saved to the database and then populate those approver fields there. Okay.
We could also do something where we could uh, disallow or remove the ability of the user uh, to set those fields. Think about if we use this in conjunction with field level security, then uh, it is the system that is determining uh, dynamically who the approvers are. And the user, they might be able to view who those people are, but they will never be able to set them. Okay. All right. I'd like to uh, start off uh, this morning by reviewing some of the questions that I wasn't able to get an immediate answer for. And specifically, there were three uh, questions or topics that came up yesterday uh, that I'd like to take a moment to address. Uh, one of the one of the uh, lines of questions that we had yesterday was around asynchronous apex and the execution of the asynchronous or the future code uh, versus the execution of the uh, the original thread. Uh, and so some of the questions were, uh, would, would an uncaught exception in an original thread roll back the asynchronous thread? And uh, is there a guarantee that an original th thread will complete before the asynchronous thread? Well, in talking to uh, one of our technical resources and then also doing a little bit of uh, testing and experimentation on my own, uh, the answer would be no. There's really there's an independent execution between the original thread and the thread that is uh, spawned because of the fact that we're running it asynchronously. Uh, so one of the tests I, I wanted to to show you a little test that I ran, uh, which was to uh, in one of uh, in our asynchronous lab that we just completed, uh, we had. Uh, we had a uh, trigger, and if you remember, our, our trigger was going to do a web service callout, and therefore we placed that uh, web service callout logic within a uh, a method marked with a future annotation uh, in order to meet our meet our uh, requirements surrounding that. And one of the things that uh, to just do a, a simple test or to show you a simple test uh, after the call to after the asynchronous call, one of the things I did here was to simply just throw a, a little exception that I created uh, just to just to see what happens. And so jumping back to my web browser, uh, let's see here if I create a new candidate. So in our case, uh, that was. Uh, uh, whenever we created a new candidate. So let's see here. Why don't I stick with my tradition of Barack Obama? Um, let me come up with a unique number here. And then let's see here. Let me fill out an address, which is our one California. Actually, it's quite nice when uh, you've typed this in before. And then CA, USA. Okay. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on the Save button. Hopefully I have everything that I need. And uh, let me fill out an uh, email address here just for my uh, so Barack at uh, whitehouse.gov. OK, so now if I save my record. Now one thing I want to point out is that uh, when you're executing asynchronous code, uh, one of the things that you can do is view the uh, the asynchronous jobs by uh, navigating within the setup menu to monitoring and then Apex jobs. So this is where you can see uh, what happened uh, in addition to the debug logs for those uh, separate asynchronous jobs that were uh, were kicked off. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on my save here, and what's going to happen? Uh, let's see here. Oh, we have our exception thrown. Okay, so uh, once again, to recap, in my uh, trigger, I threw that exception called the uh, CB exception. And now, when I come out here to the uh, Apex Jobs monitoring area, uh, let's give this some time. So we should see. Let's see here. Uh, well, let's come back to that later. <laughs> we'll try again. I have another one, though. All right, hopefully this second one <laughs> works. <laughs> All right, uh, 0 for 1. So 
All right, so let's uh, let's talk about something else. <laughs> All right, so we had a question yesterday. Uh, if a call to an AJAX action method returns a different page, in other words, uh, one of the things that our action methods do is they return uh, a page reference. So uh, by default, we set up, uh, especially if we're doing something like our action polar, we set it up to return null because we want to keep the, the user in the current location. Remember that we are doing, uh, with the action polar, we're able to implement things like a partial page refresh so that our web browser is doing uh, uh, callouts, uh, in my case, on a, on a five second interval. So let me, let me show you, uh, uh, here's a, a visual force page that is going to do a callout uh, to a controller and specifically, uh, here you see that there's, I have an action polar. The action method that I'm calling is increment uh, counter. And then uh, the interval is set to five. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to update that particular uh, action method. And instead of returning null, what I'm going to do is I'm going to return a reference to a different uh, visual force page. So if we click on save here, and then what I'll do is I'll go out and uh, maybe do a refresh, a refresh of the, here it's doing a refresh of this page. So what happens is that it seems to, let's, let's just start this over just so I can show it to you uh, from scratch. It does forward the user to the other page, but notice that there's a behavior that occurs. If you take a look at our inline editor here, uh, what it does is it then loads a second one uh, within sort of the frame of the initial one. Uh, so it, it seems to me that there's some, it's, it's something that it will execute, but there seems to be some bad behavior going on here. And I haven't attempted to analyze the underlying HTML to see if this is just the web browser uh, being kind in terms of uh, uh, being able to parse this, but it seems to be embedding uh, another page inside another page. Uh, so uh, I would recommend, at least from my cursory experimentation, to uh, avoid doing that where you're doing partial page refreshes, but then uh, sending a user to a different location. So. Uh, that being said, we do support things like uh, iframes and other things in which we could, you know, embed uh, another uh, URL or a link to another URL within the current page. Uh, so there, there are other things, but at least in this case, uh, it doesn't seem to have a, a desirable effect. Another question that uh, came up uh, yesterday was, is the constructor called on subsequent uh, requests? In other words, uh, if I initially load a visual force page, uh, will the uh, subsequent, if, if I then post uh, using something a command, like a command link or a command button, uh, and then uh, post up the uh, data within my, my form, will that then call the constructor for a second time? So we, we do know that uh, when we initially request that visual force page, uh, we call the constructor and we call the getters and setters, uh, and that, uh, uh, that first page request uh, will behave as we predict. But in a, 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 a subsequent, because we have a stateless application server, in a sub subsequent uh, call in which we're not entering in, you know, we're not doing the request of the URL, but we're posting the data in our form, will that then uh, call the constructor again? And so what I did was I created a, a very simplistic uh, visual force uh, custom controller. And what this did is it simply, I created a, uh, uh, a property with a, a getter and a setter. And I have uh, very simply, they do what they're supposed to do in terms of either setting the value passed to them or returning what's requested. So here's the uh, like I said, it's simply doing the system.debugs upon calling the getters and setters, and then also calling the constructors. So I just wanted to show you, well, what was the output from doing the, uh, those requests? Well, what happens on the initial request is that we called the uh, constructor, as shown in this uh, first line of the initial request in the debug log. Uh, the next thing that occurs was a call to the uh, setter. Uh, 
the reason this occurs is because in my code, uh, the setter is called from the controller because uh, I'm initializing the value for, in this case, uh, the string s1. Uh, and then uh, ultimately, we call uh, the getter. In the subsequent, so now when I click on the uh, link to then post up the contents of the form back up to the server and then refresh the uh, data, then what happens, for some reason, I'm, I'm not sure why, but there was a call to the getter. I know when I looked at the data, uh, it, was, it, it returned the initial value. I'm not sure what, you know, I can't really explain why that's happening. Uh, but the second call to the getter is the more important one because if I uh, updated the field value in the single line entry field, uh, the second getter returned the new value uh, that was set. But anyways, so the, the second thing that occurs is the call to the setter. So the setter was called. Uh, whatever value I entered in there was uh, uh, set. And then the getter was then called for uh, the uh, page. And then uh, the new value was returned back to me. Uh, so the, the, I guess the point here is to just to point out that the constructor, when I posted the information back up, the constructor was not called uh, during the second time. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah. For more information on Salesforce.com training and certification, please visit www.salesforce.com forward slash training.